Good morning, students. In our earlier classes, we have started the story "A Rose for Emily." When I began with my first lecture on this particular story, I told you that this story is divided into five sections. We have discussed section three of the story. Today, in this last class, we will be taking up section four and section five and winding up the story. Just for your remembrance, let me tell you a little bit about the first three sections. As pointed out earlier, a rose for Emily, as the title suggests, the main protagonist of the story is Miss Emily Greason. When the story begins in section one, we are acquainted with the death of Emily, and her death in itself is a kind of a thing in which the men and the women of the town they are wanting to attend in large numbers. And the reason behind this is curiosity. What kind of curiosity? Because Emily Greason had been living in the house where nobody was allowed entry. Nobody knew what was inside. And so when she dies, women are curious to know what happens to her, what happened to her and how did she live? And men out of some respectful affection for a fallen monument. The section one begins with her not paying the taxes, the tax officials persuading her, and getting a form and a stern reply that she has no taxes at Jefferson. The second section talks about the time when she refuses to pay the tax, a foul smell is emitting from her house, and the officials they have to jump into her house to put the line, to sprinkle the line, and get rid of that particular smell. In section three, we are introduced with the male protagonist, Homer Barron, who happens to be from a construction company. When the construction company comes to the town to begin with the construction work, Homer Barron gets, uh, you know, he, he interacts with Emily and the town people believe that they are having an affair. But when Emily, Reason and Homer Barron, they go out together, the town people, they, their tongues start wagging. And what do they talk is that how could Emily Greason fall to such a level? Falling to such a level implies that how could she go out with a man who's a contractual laborer or a one-day laborer or a, uh, a man who works on daily wages. But th that's, that's Emily Greason's problem. And in section three, we are acquainted with one more unique phenomena and that is that Emily Greason goes to the shop to purchase poison. Uh, she goes to purchase the rat poison, but she doesn't specify as to why is she going to purchase it. But while she purchases the poison, the town people are again talking about the phenomena that something is wrong between her and Homer uh, Baron, and probably she has, you know, taken poison for that. So, so the, this is a brief summary of the section three that we have covered in our earlier classes. In section four, we are going to take up the remaining part of the story. So when in section three finishes with Emily Greason purchasing the rat poison and when she and when it spreads in the town people are talking about only one thing what is she going to do now is she going to kill herself and and the people said that that was the best thing that she could do or they, uh, they, they just talked about whether she will be marrying him so everybody was left with a few questions is she going to die is she going to suffer or is she going to marry so the interaction between Emily and Homer Baron, they keep on continuing. People see him come and go. And then another thing happens. People come to know that Emily Greason had gone to the jewelers and ordered a toilet set in silver with the letter HB on each piece. After two days, the town people again learn that she had also ordered a complete set of clothing including a nightshirt. And then everybody believed in the town that Emily Greason and Homer Barron are to be married. And the surprise comes to people when they realize that Homer Barron was gone. The other day, Emily Greason was purchasing the toiletries and the clothing for Homer Barron, with the initials Homer Barron. And a few days later, they come to know that Homer Barron was gone. And then after a gap of few days, Homer Baron comes again. And the neighbors, they say that they see the man going inside. Homer Baron going inside, but he never comes out. So that was the last time when people saw of Homer Baron. 
After that, nobody knew what happened to Homer Baron. If he went inside, why didn't he come out? And what was going on inside the house? After this, nothing, nobody appeared on the street for six months. And when they next saw Emily, I'll, I'll quote from the text, she had grown fat and her hair was turning gray. In the next few years, it grew grayer and grayer until it attained an even pepper and salt iron gray when it ceased turning. Up to the day of her death, at 74, it was still that vigorous iron gray, like the hair of an active man. So section four introduces two, three things. The purchase of toiletry by Emily Creason. Homer Baron vanishing for a few days, coming back again, entering into the house of Emily Creason and not coming out. Nobody sees him after that. Nobody in fact sees Emily Creason also for some time. But when she comes out, when people see her, she has turned fat and she has turned a little, and her hair has turned gray. This all happens and finally in section 4, Emily Greeson is dead. She dies. And so she died. Fell ill in the house, filled with dust and shadows, with only a doddering Negro man to wait on her. We did not know even that she was sick. We had long since given up trying to get any information from the Negro. He talked to no one, probably not even to her, for his voice had grown harsh and rusty as if from disuse. So once Homer Baron goes inside the house of Emily Greeson, he doesn't come out. Nobody sees Emily Greeson for a few, few months. Later when people see her, she's a changed figure and this continues for years. The only man who is in attendance at the house is the old servant, the Negro, who comes in and goes out. And it is written by the writer that this man also was not indulged in talking to anybody because his voice had grown dusky. His voice has grown as if he was not using, he was not using it talking to anybody. And then section 4 finishes with the death of Emily Greeson. In section 5, we are introduced with the fact that when Emily Greeson dies, the Negro who is a servant is waiting at the door and he is admitting the women inside the house. And these women enter the house with hushed, sibilant voices, curious glances. And then, once the women enter the house, the old Negro, the servant, disappears. He, ride, he walks right through the house and is not seen again. So now the house is open for everybody to see. The old faithful servant who was there in charge of the house for many years, standing and looking after Emily Greeson and probably the father also, was no more. Women and men have free entry into the house. Now once these people enter the house, the women are more curious to know about what has been happening inside. Everything is, you know, inspected. I will lay, I'll just read out a few lines from the text that will elaborate that how does the interiors look. A thin acrid pal as the tomb seemed to lie everywhere upon this room decked and furnished as for a bridal. Upon the valance curtains of faded rose color, upon the rose shaded lights, upon the dressing table, upon the delicate area of crystal and a man's toilet things backed with tarnished silver. Silver so tarnished that the monogram was obscure. Among them lay a collar and a tie, as if they had just been removed, which lifted left upon the surface a pale crescent in the dust. Upon a chair hung the suit, carefully folded beneath it the two mute shoes and the discarded socks. The man himself lay in the bed. So the paragraph describes to you the particular room in which probably Emily Greeson and Homer Baron had been together before Homer Baron had died. And probably after his death, which Emily Greeson had lived in that room for years, everything was arranged as if it was a bridal chamber. The shoes of the men under the bed, the discarded socks, everything was there, picture perfect, nothing was removed. And the man himself was lying on the Bed. Homer Baron was dead long ago and he was, his body was never removed from the house. For a long time people stood there. The body when the ladies looked at it 
had apparently been lying in the attitude of an embrace. But now the long sleep that outlasts love, that conquers even the grinness of love, had cuckolded him. This is what happened to Homer Baron. Nothing was there upon him. And when the women observed carefully, what do they notice? Then we noticed that in the second pillow was an indentation of a head. One of us lifted something from it and leaning forward in that faint and invisible dust, dry and acrid in the nostrils, we saw a long strand of iron gray hair. So the man's body is lying on one side of the bed, the other side of the bed is empty, only the pillow lying. And when the ladies of the house, the ladies of the town, they observe carefully, they, they see that the pillow was having an indentation as if somebody was lying on it with the head marked on it and when they carefully look at it they pick up a long strand of, uh, strand of the iron grey hair assuming that probably Emily Grayson had been sleeping with the dead man for years. So this is how the story finishes. In today's class we have just finished the story, the critical appreciation of the story, the critical summary of the story and the important elements of the story will be discussed in tomorrow's class. Thank you.